Kitty Cats podcast episode eight. If you're a returning viewer, it's so nice to see you again. But if you're new, welcome to our pod. My name is Julie and I'm a Colorado knitter, dyer, crocheter, spinner, seamstress, but most importantly, cat rescuer. I come to you today from the foothills of the Northern Colorado Rocky Mountains. <laughs> and it's cold today. It's very cold today. I, it's it's mid-morning and I just looked at the temperature. It's minus four degrees Fahrenheit, which in Celsius is minus 20. And the wind chill factor is a minus 35, which is a minus 37 for you. That's crazy. It's crazy cold. But I do have a warm cup of tea and my handmade mug that I made I don't know how many years ago. That's a previous life of crafting that I'll talk about later. Um, but I love clay bodies like this that are handmade because they do keep the tea super warm or coffee, whatever you're drinking. So I was glad that this emerged from my cupboard. My kids have left again for college. So I'm able to see the back of the cupboard and what mugs we actually have. So super good and super warm because it's cold outside, it's snowing. I love snow, I love winter, and it is the perfect day to be talking about Norwegian knitting. We're gonna not only talk about Norwegian knitting, I'm gonna show you some Norwegian knitting, but the most exciting thing is I have an interview with a Norwegian pattern designer from Norway. I will, we're gonna do that Zoom. I've contacted her and I'm so excited to share with you. I've never spoken to her. I've only um, conversed via words or typing internet. So I can't wait to hear her accent. I'm, I'm just super excited for this interview. So stay tuned because that will be coming up right after I explain to you where I got to where I am <laughs> with Norwegian Knitting. So if you'll remember from episode six, I talked a little bit about seeing these myths on someone skiing. So my husband was doing a race in the mountains, a cross country race. There were a lot of Norwegians there and I walked out to put my skis on and noticed this woman and she had these beautiful black and white mitts and it was cold up there. And I thought, how is she staying warm? But mostly they are so beautiful. <laughs> so I talked to her and I said, are you warm in those? And she said, oh yes. In my country, we ski in these. And I thought, what? It's cold out here. How are you skiing in just wool mittens, not like big mitts? And then it hit me, you know, when you're cross country skiing, you get very warm or snowshoeing, so much so that when, that when I'm doing that, I usually end up taking my mitts, my big ski mittens off, and I ski in just liners because you're working your upper body so hard. So I just, they, that those mittens didn't leave my head. And I thought one day I'm gonna make those. So like we do as knitters, I bought the yarn. <laughs> the yarn I thought that you would use to make the mittens. So I bought a whole bunch of different colors of Letlopi, sat on it, sat on it, didn't make them. But I did think about them. I'd look at the Letlopi and think, I want those Norwegian mitts. They ju it just seemed so overwhelming to me. Like I could never make something like that. I had done color work sweaters, but I thought this is a different animal. They're small, they're, you know, they're flat. Um, how, they have a thumb that has color work on them. How am I ever gonna make those? I'm not, I don't think I can. <laughs> but then I got a book a couple of Christmases ago for my husband, which I shared with you on episode six. And it's a book that had just, um, it's called Knits from Northern Lands, 20 projects inspired by inspired by traditional knitting techniques from the Scottish Isles to Scandinavia. Well, I'm thumbing through it and it has, it has beautiful, beautiful patterns in it. I could make them all, but do you know the one that caught my eye? <laughs> yeah, there they are again. There's those mittens. So I read the story and I'm gonna read it again really quick in case you missed it, but it also set the tone of what we're gonna talk about today with um, my designer. In 1857, Marit Emstad of Selbu, Norway, did something out of the ordinary. Using two different colors of fiber, she created a detailed rose design on mittens knit for her and her sisters to wear to church. Now remember that. This new way of knitting earned Marit Merit, I don't know, we're gonna ask how to really pronounce that name, the title of the mother of two color knitting. This pattern was designed with simplicity in mind while staying true to the traditional aspects of Selbu mittens. 
Intricate color work showcases the cell bureaus, the unique thumb gusset, and the side bands. So I dove into this pattern, but first of all, I needed more yarn, right? Because I wasn't gonna make a Norwegian pattern with anything but Norwegian yarn. So I knew one of my local yarn shops carried Sand Nest Garn, which I knew was a Norwegian knitting company, knitting yarn, yarn mill. <laughs> So I went and picked colors, and I the pattern called for, for worsted weight. And I thought Pure Gant was worsted weight. It's not, it's DK. But it was okay because it still worked for me. So I used, I used the same color, the same needles, which was a US 4, 3.5 millimeters for the main part of the mitten. And I knit tight. So it kind of compensated for not using a thick yarn. So I'm gonna debut my mittens right now. <laughs> I love them so much. I, I, as I finished one, I was speechless. And I'm like, I love these so much. I love these so much. I can't believe I made these. I can't believe I made flat mittens. I can't believe I made mittens that fit me. Um, I can't believe it. I can't, and they have the, I mean, everything about them I love, right? So the, this is the Selbu Rose, the thumb gusset with color work, this beautiful long um, cuff, which if you are out in a very cold weather, how nice to keep your uh, wrists warm. Not all the patterns are this long, and I actually don't know that I'd make another long one because it's kind of hard to get on with my coat but I love them. I love them so much. I've worn them since October. No, November. I finished them in November, both of them. And they are warm. I use them just for walking. Yesterday I walked in them with a liner and they were so warm. It was below, I don't know what it was. It was just as cold yesterday as it is today. So I'm really thrilled with my mittens and it made me want to dive in more into the history of Norwegian knittings, knitting and the mitts. And I also wanted to make a hat because I used two balls of the main color for this, two of the gray and one of the blue. And because I had to buy a second ball of the gray, I had a little extra and I had quite a bit of the blue. So I wanted to make a hat. It was hard to find a hat pattern because it was DK weight. And I wanted the Selby Rose. I never did find a DK weight with the Selby Rose in English. I did find them in um, Norwegian, <laughs> but I don't speak Norwegian. I did end up finding a pattern that had a little bit of a rose look to it and I reversed it. You can see this is what happens when you reverse same colors. I reversed it. I, I like this better. I like the light with the dark. So that's something I've kind of discovered, but it was close enough to, to make a hat and I put my little handmade pom-pom on it. I'll show you how to do those another time because they're really easy. But I love, I love the whole thing. But what it started was while I was knitting these, I thought I, I'm really interested in the history of about what's happening here. So I went to the library. I, my little library had several books on Norwegian knitting and Scandinavian knitting. And they had several that I could borrow from other libraries. They bring them in. I don't know if your library does that, but I had like six books on Norwegian knitting. I mean, I dove in to the history of Norwegian knitting. <laughs> now, I want to tell you the one that I found the most wonderful. This book is wonderful. And it is called Myths from Around Norway. And it's more than a pattern book. It's a history book. I loved the book for what's inside, but I also noticed the author's name. And her married last name is my maiden name. I mentioned to you before that my father's family, my father's father's family on the paternal side, they are from Norway. We have the documentation, the signatures when they came into the country. They came in during the big emigration of Norway. From 1970 to 1930, one third of the population of Norway immigrated to the United States. One third of the population, 900,000 people. That's when my family came. So it was just really interesting and I would have 
read it anyway, but once I started looking at the book, I quickly realized it's a history book. It's a history book. And I have read this book from cover to cover. Um, and that's who we are going to be talking to next. She has beautiful patterns, beautiful tips. Um, I'll talk more about the book when we interview. There are pictures of her mother in here. The reason that this book is so amazing is that Nina, her name is Nina, she would take a, a picture from a museum of hand-knit gloves from Norway, historical gloves, and she did the work and rewrote the pattern so that you and I can knit these gloves, these mitts. And she did this all the way through her book. Not only are there historical tidbits and um, facts about knitting in Norway, this is a history book. Here are our little kids' mittens. Here are the little kids' mittens. So this book, I told my husband I have to buy this book. <laughs> well, guess what? The book's out of print. So I had a little bit of a challenge and I did find that there are actually several of them used through used book dealers online. I did find one, I wanted one in used condition. I think I paid 45 or 46 or $50 for this book, but it was well worth it. I was so excited when it came. I have read it cover to cover and I'm so very happy to be bringing you um, Nina via Zoom to answer questions about the history of knitting what she does, what the culture of knitting is like in Norway, and um, some of her favorite things just as a designer, as, an, as a fellow knitter. So coming up, I will do that. We will talk to her. But I also wanted to tell you that right after the interview, I'm going to do a little tutorial on how to read charts because it's super easy. It was intimidating for me. I now love charts. It's my favorite way to do color work. They are so easy and it will make your knitting easy too. So, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Nina, and I'm not gonna pronounce her whole name because I want her to pronounce it. So Nina grew up in Asker, Norway, just outside Oslo. Her love and interest for knitting, crocheting, sewing, and embroidery started before going to school. She's educated, she is an educated craft teacher and worked for a short time in a high school. In 1987, she started her career as a journalist <clears throat> for a Norwegian arts and craft magazine. Today she works as the editor-in-chief of a magazine about houses and property. I'm not pronouncing the names of the, of the magazines because I can't. <laughs> Nina has written several books about arts and crafts and makes designs in, for Norwegian magazines. Making Cushions and Pillows is her first book published outside of Norway. She's created several original and visually striking craft, striking craft I'm sorry. She is creating several original and visually striking crafts in Scandinavian influence tradition. So stay tuned and up next we're going to talk to Nina. Okay, are you there Nina? Yes. Okay, I'm so here. one of the wonderful things that I wanted to do regarding this 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 Zoom was to actually hear your accent. So I'm going to have your you pronounce your name for us first. My name is Nina Grandlund Seter. Okay, that's wonderful. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how in Norway your culture, how you started knitting and at what age, and just kind of talk about that, who taught you, and... I remember very well uh, starting to knit. Uh, it was in 1965. Uh, my mother was having another baby. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, I was not five years old yet. Uh, and she was knitting lots of 
and napkins and napkin holders. Uh, so uh, for my uh, for the new baby in lots of colors, and I wanted to knit as well. Now, when you say napkins, do you mean diapers? Oh yeah, I mean okay. I mean no, I didn't know that's yeah. fine. Okay, so you yeah. so you hand your mother was hand knitting diapers or napkins no. for the baby. Uh, the trousers to have around. Okay, and lots of baby clothes. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah. you wanted to knit too. So that's when your I mom want, being pregnant taught I, you. I wanted to knit too. And she had a little book with um, patterns. And in that book, it was a picture of an, um, uh, a small kind of teddy bear. And I wanted to knit that uh, teddy bear. It was made out of small uh, pieces. Uh, so I managed. And then from there, you started maybe knitting baby clothes? No, I didn't knit any baby oh. clothes. No. <laughs> no. Okay. So you... I, knit, I knitted things, uh, uh, small things for myself. Okay. And then? Like a scarf. I think I started with a scarf or uh, uh, maybe a hat. Yeah. And that was, but... was that typical in Norway that, that they would start that young? Yes and no, uh, but uh, uh, when I grew up, all children in Norway learned to knit in school when we were about eight or nine. So some 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 of us uh, were quite good at that time, and some were uh, had to practice a little bit more. And then, what would you say that many of the children then would keep? going after that? Was that a time that, that it kept on and then they would grow up and knit for themselves? Yeah, I yeah. think so. So everybody had to knit a um, pair of mittens. Okay. That mittens. was the first we, we had, had to knit in school. Okay. Uh, but uh, I finished my mittens very, very uh, fast. So uh, I was about 10, 11, when I knitted my first uh, sweater. Wow. And was it a raglan sweater or did it have s the sleeves? It was a raglan. A raglan, yeah. okay. Yeah. So it's up down. Yeah. And I remember very well, it was uh, striped with blue and white and turquoise. Oh, wow. <laughs> so did your, did your grandparents on both sides knit as well? um grandmothers yes but uh never when i visited my my uh, um, grandfather uh, grandmother on my father's side uh, she lived quite uh long away so i didn't see her very much okay and uh, my other grandmother uh she didn't knit very much she had but she wasn't anymore okay all right. Mm. So, so I never, I never saw uh, them knit very much. Now, so you learned when you were five, and then you did again in school. You knit again in school, and both boys and girls had to learn then as well. Uh, not the boys at that time, no. but today boys have to learn to knit uh, as well. It's and cool. my, son, my son is quite good uh, in uh, knitting. Uh, I just uh, think he, uh, he has to sit uh, by my side uh, for some minutes and he will knit again very nicely. Oh, nice. So in school, about the same age, 8 or 11, they, they're teaching boys and girls again? Yeah, about 10, I think, today. Oh, good. But I wanted to also ask... Um, Knitting has had an uptick in the world. I mean, all over the world, knitting has become very popular again. Have you seen yeah. that in Norway as well? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. I used to work in a um, um, uh, mag handicraft magazine mm -hmm. uh, earlier. And uh, uh, it was a lot of knitting in front of 
the Olympics in 1994. Uh, everybody wanted knitted sweaters. Uh, but after the Olympics, nobody knitted anymore. So it was totally stopped. Huh. So um, I remember I was very concerned because um, the wool mills didn't sell uh, any yarn. And uh, there were only old uh, ladies knitting socks. Huh. Um, and then something happened again in 2010, 2010. Okay. Uh, in here in Norway, there was a um, famous girl who knitted a very, very simple sweater uh, and made the pattern and lots of young people wanted this. And we also uh, had Arnan Carlos. I don't know if you yeah. don't know oh, them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but they made um, uh, small um, Christmas, Christmas balls. Uh, it became very popular. And that was in 2010. And after it has been like... Um, <laughs> a heritage. tsunami. <laughs> a tsunami, yes. And uh, it's very... It's very... Um, uh, um, nice that so many young girls uh, and boys too, but especially young girls are knitting and uh, they are today they are knitting for their babies and for themselves. And I would never have dreamt about it uh, uh, in the late 90s. Because that's when you were working at on the craft magazine. Was yeah. it the late 90s? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that would be hard seeing your craft phasing out. So mm. it would be really nice to have it come back like it has. Because yeah. it's, it's crazy. Um, I have a question, a personal question. Do you, when you learned to knit, did you knit with wooden needles when you were young? No. No? What did you no, use? Met metal needles. Metal needles, yes. okay. Yeah, and in Norway, we use a lot of, uh, we knit in the round. With the circular needles, yeah. Circular okay. needle, yeah. And that's what uh, you use now and most people do? Yeah. Okay. And you we use the circular needle for going back and front too. So when you knit your mittens, are you doing the magic loop or no. double point? No, I use five. Uh, then I use um, five. Uh, five double point needles, okay. Yeah, like this. Okay, so are you a continental knitter or an English knitter? Do you know what? Do oh, you know that? I'm definitely a continental. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's much faster. It's yes. much faster than the English way where, where you have the thread on the right uh -huh. instead of have it on the left and you right. just pick it in. Did you learn continental? Did you learn uh, that way or did you learn English knitting? No, I've never learned English knitting. Okay, so they taught that from the beginning. Oh, the yeah. Okay. Yeah, everybody in Norway knits uh, the continental way. Okay. Yeah. And so when you learned to knit, obviously, and then you said you knit your first sweater, and then was it a continual passion or did it kind of come and go? It has been a continuous passion. Uh, but uh, sometimes a little bit more and sometimes a little bit less, but mm -hmm. always knitting. And I remember very well from uh, high school, we sat in the classroom and knitted, all the girls knitted oh. uh, during lessons. Huh. Um, some teachers didn't like it and then some said it was okay. <laughs> So, yeah. um, your favorite things to knit are? <laughs> oh, that depends because uh, right now I'm doing a new book with sweaters. So now I knit sweaters, uh, but I love knitting uh, mittens uh, as well. And suddenly I want to knit a shawl or a hat or 
something else. Well, I love, I, and I encourage all the viewers to follow you on Instagram and Facebook and Ravelry, and I'll put all the links in the show notes because I, once I got the book, I started following, following you on Instagram and your pictures are absolutely amazing. They are so beautiful the way you lay them out. They're all mittens. And the one that I especially love is the Christmas tree. And I'll put a picture of that. Oh. <laughs> you have a Christmas tree decorated with your hand knit mittens. And I just thought, oh, that'll be a dream. One day, full size mittens. <laughs> oh, that was just a joke. <laughs> oh, it was a joke. Oh my gosh. I it thought was it was a so joke. Funny. It was. I, I uh, had all this red and white mittens. I, had, um, I have all my, uh, my, my mittens here in a box. And um, uh, before I put on the other uh, uh, Christmas uh, things, I thought, oh, I'll just put up the mittens. <laughs> and I did it just to take a photo. And I that was great. On, I guess. Yeah. I thought, wow, how much work, how many hours are on that tree? Which brings me to another Instagram post I saw of you standing on a bridge, I think, and you were knitting yes. and not yes. looking. And I'm, you were knitting and not looking. And I thought, do you knit your color work and not look? Or do you have to look? Oh, I look uh, now and then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to look all the time. Uh, um, I, uh, it's, if it's an easy pattern, uh, I'm counting. Uh, for instance, three, one, three, one. I don't yeah. have to look all the time. So I, I do a lot of uh, TV watching while I'm uh, knitting. Okay, I do too. Well, I watch podcasts. That's how I got started down this rabbit hole. I want to ask yeah. you a question about the mitts. These are my first mitts that I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of the things that what took me so long to dive in was I couldn't figure out how they would go flat. Oh, <laughs> and so I thought I'm never gonna be able to do it. And then I looked when I turn it inside out. Is it what is me? Is it the pulling? What's making it go flat? There's something here happening that pulls it tight and makes it go flat. Is it just this ditch structure or the you can see how but I to my surprise, when I started doing it and it went flat, I was giddy. I couldn't believe that then my mitts too were going to go flat. I didn't know if people press them to make them go flat? I didn't know. Uh, they, um, you can, when you have finished the mittens, I recommend that you either wash them very, uh, uh, very nice and, and let them lay flat okay. to get dry. Or you press them a little with the iron and a cloth. I did press mine, steam, yeah. steam, steam blocked them. Steam, yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm beside myself that I did it. I can't believe it. But, um, and then I ha you had a tip in your book. You have lots of tips in this book, this favorite book that I have that I talked about mm -hmm. how I, I went and bought a used one online and I paid, I think almost $50 to get it because I wanted a like new book. I love this book. But you have lots of tips in here on how to, to make the mittens. And one of the questions that I had was sizing because there's one size and people have different size hands. And you tell us what your tip was in here for, for resizing. Uh, you can use different uh, needles. Uh, if you have small needles, you can use the same yarn and uh, change the needles so uh, what do you call it gauge 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 uh, gauge will uh, will be different okay uh, so when when you have thicker needles the uh, mittens will be bigger okay so you and if you wear, if you want really big mittens, you can use a thicker yarn as well. Yeah, that was the interesting thing. I, I kept looking at. I'm thinking there's one size, and there's no adjusting a pattern because it then you'll mess it up. So when I saw that, I thought, oh, that makes so much sense. Now I did notice also uh, most of your mittens in here are either fingering 
or sport weight yarn. Yeah. And is that just to make a detailed pattern or to make it tighter? Yeah, yeah it's detailed because uh, I love the old mittens because they have very detailed patterns. So I do the same. So when uh, lots of people only have uh, 40 stitches to make uh, one mitten, uh, mm -hmm. I prefer uh, 70, 80 to get the really rich and detailed patterns. And I'm much more work, but uh, uh, it's uh, it turns out uh, very nice. Um, I was going to ask you a question about yarn festivals. Like we have them here and they've gotten to be pretty big things. But I was just watching a podcast yesterday and I think last week or the week before there was a big yarn festival in Oslo. Do you know about um, that? Or? I, I don't know about any in Oslo now, but no. there are so many yarn festivals and knitting okay. festivals that uh, I can't uh, join them all. Oh my uh, gosh. I'm a full-time worker, so I have <laughs> to do it in my uh, spare time. So yes. I, I go to some of them. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Do All you have the country, it, it, it's uh, festivals. That's great. It's great yeah. news. Because, you know, yeah. I'm heading there next year, and I'm hoping to hit one. Or, no, it's this yeah. year now that I'm going. So yeah. um, I, I was going to um, the wool and sheep festival in um rhinebeck rhinebeck but uh we had to cancel because of the corona uh, so uh, that was very sad so do you think you'll go again one day yeah i okay. will some nice. someday <laughs> yeah okay so do you have a favorite yarn uh yeah uh, it depends on what I'm uh, knitting, because when I'm knitting mittens, I prefer uh, yarn with a little bit more twist, because okay. it's stronger. But when I'm making a pullover, I want, for instance, lamb wool or uh, uh, some mohair to, to get it really nice against the skin. Mm -hmm. So talking about wool, is there a special breed of sheep that typically Norwegians use or that is that they originally use? Do you have your own breed? Yeah, there are, I think it's uh, eight or nine different uh, sheep uh, um, here in Norway. Um, I, um, I think it's very good that we have been able to take care of the old sheep uh like uh it's called sparsev and vilsev they are they are from the viking time oh wow so oh that's nice mittens you've got and um, so uh, uh lots of people are interested in using Norwegian uh, wool, it's a uh, lot of, uh, it's uh, very elastic. Uh, but when you are knitting something to be into your skin, um, you, many of us prefer merino, and we don't have any merino here in Norway. Okay. So or alpaca, or silk or yeah i use a lot of fibers i okay. try to uh, to choose different well because you said that you were you're a knitter a crocheter mm -hmm. you did a lot of weaving yep that right and then um embroidery yep and do you sew yeah i used to <laughs> okay. I, not an, not much anymore but i've made lots of um of um uh i've made clothes and i have also made a lot of patchwork uh <laughs> yeah uh, uh, everything in textile i've been into some time i think 
How did you make the leap from you're a journalist and you went from knit arts and crafts to homes, homes and property, you said. You're the editor in chief uh, of a homes and property magazine. Yep, I am. Oh, oh I, I just got an offer I couldn't say <laughs> no to. Okay. They so uh, <laughs> I was, uh, uh, in a way, headhunted to do the job I have today, and I've stayed there for nearly. 25 years now. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You are quite accomplished. I, I, I'm glad that I didn't read your bio before I asked you because I would have been too intimidated. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you real quick. My sister wanted me to ask you, do you use any of the guides for color work, like these tools to hold no. the... No, you've never seen oh, them. Either. No, 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 no. no. No, you just put them on your finger. Uh, I've seen some of them you can put on your finger and like that. Uh -huh. No, I don't. No. Just... Okay. Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I have so many questions. In your book, you had pictures of your mom skiing, and I did ask you about that picture, but there was a time. So let me just go back in history. You said that in the 1700s, the spinning mills changed changed everything. The, the English spinning mills changed the ability for people to have wool. Yeah. With. And then hand spinning, like spindles and things, spinning wheels came in. Yeah, I think they had to do the, the, the hand spinning from long before. Okay. Uh, so when the mills came, uh, it got easier to get the yarn. Um, but it was a lot of hand spinning in Norway until oh, 19, yeah, Second World War, okay. I think. So because uh, the fabrics they made um, yarn for the weaving, not for knitting. So lots of people um, uh, made their own uh, knitting yarn. Okay. Yeah. That's so interesting. And now I wanted to ask you, number one, I want you to talk about how they recycled the mitts, how you talked about in your book, how they would knit them initially for dress or church. Yeah, when um, wool was very, um, uh, it was very um, scarce. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have so many uh, sheep, so they it was it was very valuable. So they had to take care of it, and uh, when uh, mittens or a sweater uh, was uh, worn out, and they had um, uh, repaired it a lot of time. Uh, they could deliver it into the mills again and get some money, some small money for the old and shabby um, mittens or sweaters. So uh, it was recycled. It was uh, 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 taken apart again and spun together with uh, new wool. Okay. Or used, or used as isolation in the walls of the houses or as uh, bed covers. Oh, resourceful. Yeah. Well, you talk about in this book the, I don't even know how you say it, mittens from id. Is that how you say it or how would you say that? Yeah, id. Id. And yeah. it talks about how you dated them. Um, from 1858 yeah. because it was knit into the cuff. The date was knit into the cuff. Yes, it was. Uh, I have spoken to some women from the area and they says that um, everybody knitted exactly this pattern um, before, until the 70s or 80s, I think. Huh. Uh, so this is an old pattern they've been knitting locally 
This is the southeastern part of Norway. And this would be a really good beginner pattern, I think, for people because it doesn't have a lot of, you wouldn't have to carry floats. No, it's uh, very easy to very make easy pattern. Uh, if, when, uh, with two colors, yes. Well, these are the next ones that I'm going to knit. I just want to let you know, because I love cats. That's nice. I love this one. And, um, oh, and the porcelain ones. Oh my gosh, they are so yeah. beautiful. I'll put a picture up of those. Um, but I want you to talk really quick. Um, and if we get cut off, I'll call you back. But because I wanted okay. to talk for a minute about the fisherman mitts. Those were, I was blown away. So tell us about the fisherman mitts and I will put a little picture up. Yes, they are, they are very big. Uh, and the fishermen used uh, um, a small rope to tie them around uh, the wrist. Uh -huh. uh, and they used it uh, when they were uh, rowing in a boat or when they were um, catching the fish or they were uh, cleaning it up. Um, they used it all the time when they were out. It was before they had um, uh, oil skin or uh, other uh, materials. And some of those mittens uh, had two thumbs. So uh, they got um, worn out on the inside, but if they had two thumbs, they can turn them around and use them on both sides. Oh, that's so interesting. And you said that you, they made them like once a year, they get a new pair of mittens. Oh, uh, yeah. I, th I think th when they went up north to, to fish uh, in Lofoten, uh, where the cod is coming into, to, um, what do you say? When the cod is uh, laying eggs, um, they, they, needed five pairs that was uh, they needed five pair for one season because they were worn out and they used human hair you said yeah some did that to 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 um, make them stronger to 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 let them last uh, uh -huh. longer so the women uh, they when they come their hair they took care of it and put it into the yarn when they spun it. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, um, the other we thing- We don't that do that I, anymore. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> you talked about the spinning mills changing the revolutionizing production. And then the names that you mentioned were that, that during that time were Sandness, Hillsfog and Rauma. And they're all still making yarn today. I was blown away when I read that. They you buy it today. Yeah, they are, uh, they are old mills uh, still going uh, uh, very well, very well today yeah. because so many are buying the yarn. That's great. I yeah. just have, I have one more question really was, do you have a favorite food, both savory or sweet? Like, do you have a favorite cookie or anything? Oh, favorite, traditional, favorite traditional. Food. Traditional food. Oh, I'm very uh, fond of uh, fish. Okay. Uh, for instance, cod. Um, uh, so when I go to a restaurant, uh, I very often choose fish. Okay. Uh, we have a fish called Breiflab in Norwegian. I don't know what it's in English, but it's um, it's living very deep. So it's looks very ugly but um, <laughs> the, um it uh, tastes wonderful uh, and the sweet i'm i'm not eating very much chocolate um but i like lacrosse i'm a big fan of cardamom so i love that you cook with cardamom well we're almost out of time and I am so grateful to you that you gave me this opportunity to talk to you and learn and make this book real for me because I'm continuing. You can see all the marks I have 
are, are the things that I love. And I encourage people to try and find this book. Oh, really quick. Um, how can we buy your new book? Because you have seven books. That, this will be your seventh book, right? And uh, no, I'm, I'm working with my book number 14th. Oh, gosh. Yeah, but uh, um, I'm, I've made some small books and different books that are not uh, uh, translated into English. Um, but this yes. latest one is? Uh, with the socks. No, the fairy, is it fairy tale mitten? A fa oh, that's an, e uh, it's just uh, 12 patterns. It's okay. not very big. And it's uh, an e-book on Ravelry. Okay, good, yeah. great. So I want to remind everyone that you're that I'm going to put all the links in so they can follow you and buy your patterns. Just make sure that when you're on Ravelry, you look because not all of them are in English and Norwegian. They're they're kind of half and half. So I hope that um, people go and find you and buy your books because I really, really have enjoyed it. And I hope they can find this one because this is a treasure. It's just a treasure. I love this book. Um, anything else? No, it was great talking to you. Oh, thank you um, so much. Yeah. I've, I've just I've been to Colorado once. Oh, uh, I, I drove to from uh, from South uh, um, Dakota and through all the Colorado and south to uh, New Mexico and uh, yeah, all the way. Well, I'm sorry I missed you. Next time, look me up. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> I will. I love you. Yes. I've been there uh, several times. Well, I hope that you come back and thank you very, very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank we'll, you. I'll talk to you soon, Nina. Yeah. Bye bye. Uh Welcome to Chart Reading 101. Please remember, I'm not an expert. I just get comments all the time from people that say they need help. So this is a, gonna be a real quick, how to pick a pattern, how to read a chart. So a couple things that are really important is finding something that can hold and keep track of your chart as you go up. So I found this a long time ago. This is just a metal, I think it's like an office supply something. <laughs> but it allows you to set it on the table next to you. You can make it up, go up or down and keep track of your pattern. I like it for just holding a pattern. If I'm sitting and I have, have a pattern next to me, um, you can use this. It just clips on and it can keep track of wherever you're at in your pattern. Or in the case of a chart, you can go, you go up. So it allows you to do that. I also like it because it's metal. And you can, if you have another, or you need a second magnet, you can use these uh, little ones. I got this at Hobby Lobby a long time ago, but I did use it quite a bit. Or for a smaller chart, here's the thumb chart one, thumb chart two. So you can see that that is something that is very helpful. And I will put the link on this for this piece in the show notes too. I believe it was $13. So hopefully everyone can afford that. And it's very helpful anyway. The next thing is kind of the ultimate is it's the Coco Knits Folio. These are cool. I love this because we can travel with it. You can fold it up. It stores easily, doesn't take a lot of space. It has a super strong magnet, a magnet on each side here and also here. And for whatever reason, I think it's because it is a magnet. It, it does stand up wherever you put it. And this comes with pattern holders and you can buy additional things. Like I bought um, the Coco Knits needle point or the needle measurement tool. I got all of these at My Sister Knits in Fort Collins. But it comes with this right here. I think that's what it comes with. It runs about $30, but I think this is also well worth it. It's just so nice to travel with. And then this is a super strong magnet. So either one of these work, but I wanted to tell you those are the couple things that are super important to get before you get started.
So how do you pick a pattern to knit if you haven't ever knit stranded color work and or these mitts? Well, one of the things that I think is the hardest thing to do is carry your floats. And I'm gonna show you what a float is. This is a float. So this is a color work hat. Cutest cats, of course. This is a pattern I think I got from Knit Picks. I bought a whole cat motif book. But a float is what the is the back. So if you have too long of a float, it kind of pulls, it pulls and doesn't make a nice color work section. So if you usually the rule is if you have more than three or four stitches of the same color, you have to catch the float. And you're gonna have to look that up on YouTube because I don't wanna take the time right now to explain that. But what I do wanna show you is how do you just kind of eyeball a good pattern to pick. If you'll notice here, this pattern, you, it looks the busiest, but I have to say the busier ones are kind of the easier because they have these patterns and you just, after a while, you don't really have to look. So these, these here are, are just one color, that's easy. This, you can see one, two, three. That to me looks like the most you'd ever have to do is three. So there's no carrying of floats. Same with this one, one, two, three, change color, one, two, yeah. So this one, no carrying of floats. So this is actually a good pattern if, you, if you're new. This also is a good pattern. Uh, well, this one has one, two, three, four. So you may, wait, one, two, three, four, five. Probably wouldn't do this one. So let's check this one out. This one looks super busy, but you can see it doesn't have any areas where there's more than really, I think three is the max on this. So this is a good one too. This is a, a good pattern to pick. And then you'll learn to eyeball the ones that aren't that good. This one, not so good, because you can see there are long areas of floats in between. So you're knitting along and you have to, you're gonna have to catch this, the floats several times on something like this. I don't know if you can see that. So look for the bigger spaces. Don't worry about the big sections because that is just one color. This one, unfortunately, although it's beautiful with Kit Kats, <laughs> I thought this was darling. There are long areas of floats where you're gonna have to carry the floats, I mean. So again, not that you can't do that, but if you're just starting, stay clear of those. So I want to try and show you how to read a chart. And because I want to be careful not to give away someone's pattern, I tried to find free ones on the internet and um, they're not, really easy to easy I mean I hope you can see them because they're they're kind of faded so this one you can see on the back it doesn't have a lot of lot long large areas where you'd have to float this one does you can see right here this does but I'm going to still use it for an example because I want to show you how to read a chart so what you do chart reading is kind of backwards from what you think. You actually start in the bottom right corner. So you start here and you knit across. And at first it's hard to kind of get oriented, but after you start it's easy because that's actually how you're knitting. And I'm sure that's why they do that. That's how you're knitting along. So that's why these are important because you just move up and then you start on the next one and you just move up and start on the next one and you just keep going across. This has a little bit hard of a, harder of a index to read. It's not called an index, but I can't think of a name. This one, you can kind of see the dark ones are a knit with contrast color one, knit with main color, slip, sit, stitch, slip, slip, stitch with main color, knit two together with main color, no stitch. So you can see, and I'll try to hide this pattern. I don't know, these are, so you would see on this row, you would knit, knit two with the main color, then three with the contrast color, one, two, three, four, five with the main color, and so on. So it's super easy. Again, this is when you'd have to carry some floats. 
I do want to tell you, don't freak out about this. That's what I kind of thought. I'm like, how is that gonna work? Why are there still, why are there blanks? And sometimes there are blanks and sometimes like they've taken them out completely. So when you come to them, I promise you, it just happens because those are actually your decreases. You can see here that you did your slip, slip stitches, slip, slip knits and your knit two together and it just decreases and it works. It's not hard at all. I don't want you to be afraid to try this. I do want to show you um, one more thing. Oh, so for instance, on this one, where you will see that it actually starts with row 17. Well, that's kind of weird, but not really, because if you'll notice in the pattern, and these are called garden party mitts, and they are free on Ravelry. That's why I chose it, so I could actually show you things. You'll notice here that the first thing says, cast on 48 stitches, and then you knit the first 16 rows. That's why the pattern starts at 17, row 17. So it's actually really easy. Um, some patterns do not have the little numbers like that, which I really like the little numbers, and I think it's just I've trained myself that I want them. So when I saw some of Nina's patterns, I was panicked in her book because I'm like, oh my gosh, they do not have numbers. So I asked her what she did and she said, you know, if you need to, you can just go across and like every one or every other one, you can use colored pencils. But I actually found that once, for instance, I did that here, but I actually found that once I started, you kind of can see what's underneath and you know where you're at, you don't have to keep track. But the one thing I do do, I have to say, when, I, when I'm done for the night, if I'm knitting, just in case my magnet gets hit, I will, like if I start it, stopped here, I'll take a pencil and just draw a little line out. And that's where I stopped. So then I can start on the next row. And that's what I do. I don't know if there's anything else to tell you because it's that easy. Don't be afraid, just try it. We're gonna talk about, we talked about gauge and I think you guys are set and ready. What I do wanna tell you is you can usually eyeball a pattern and see if it's gonna have a lot of floats and if you're okay with floats, then give it a shot. I want to tell you the one thing that I have found is the patterns that are free do not have the best of it instructions. So it's worth purchasing a pattern. Someone worked really hard to put it together and make it nice for you. So I think it's worth the seven, six, eight, ten dollars that you pay for a pattern because they turn out nice. Happy knitting. Thank you for joining me today. I hope it was as informative and inspirational for you as it was for me. I hope you head off to your library. I hope you buy some of Nina's books. Um, they are out there. And I hope that you follow her on Facebook, Instagram, Ravelry. I have the links to all of those in the show notes. She is an amazing designer and I was thrilled to have this opportunity to, to interview her. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>